As you may or may not know, um, sometimes I just hang out with the, the, the live audience at the show. It's called Between the Scenes, because we've done the scenes and we are now between them. Um, <laughs> I, so I, I'll just throw something at you, and, and really, this is just a preamble. If you have any questions for Mayor Pete, please think about what the question is. Think of, like, like really an idea that, that hopefully can move a conversation forward. Um, just, to, just to spark that. All these ideas that you have that you speak about in interviews, I've been fascinated by. You know, like reparations. Yeah. It's not an easy right. question to answer. People make it seem like it is, but it isn't easy. Implementation, the conversation, uh, the, the, you know, all of the facets in and around it. And you have an answer on that. And you'll, you know, you speak about racial injustice and you speak about, you know, people in the heartland, et cetera. How, like, how do you have these ideas? Like, I, I know it so- sounds like a stupid question, but are you constantly trying to engage in, in these difficult issues and then learning how you think you would tackle them? Or are you just a byproduct of your age and the time that you live in? Hmm. That is really profound. I, I think, um, I mean, it's gotta be a combination of those things, right? I mean, there, there's, there's the philosophies and the values that guide you, but then it gets sharpened into a particular question you realize you're gonna have to answer. And, uh, you know, the questions that are coming at us in this process, I think, are forcing us to think in new ways. I mean, the reparations thing was not as serious, uh, or at least not taken seriously, uh, uh, in presidential politics until this cycle. And suddenly it's something that every one of us has to have a thoughtful answer on. Um, And, of course, to some extent, there are questions where they're trying to trip you up, right? And that can happen, too, around, you know, does does Medicare for all mean abolishing private insurance or not? Things like that. Um, And so the the best thing I can think to do is to explain where I come from, Uh um, explain what I believe, and then see what people think. Um, Because sometimes, you know, I'm not going to change my values based on feedback, but sometimes you you learn something you didn't think about. Um, Or at the very least, you you learn the best vocabulary to convey what you care about. What is one thing you learned about today hanging out with um, Reverend Al Sharpton? Well, one thing that really interests him is the... First, sorry to interrupt you. First things first, did you eat the hot sauce? I did. Because <laughs> the hot sauce is always on the table, and I've seen candidates there, and I'm like, does anyone actually use that hot sauce? I decided to save that until the cameras were, didn't seem to be watching <laughs> us, because, like, nothing good can come of putting on hot sauce when right. the cameras are watching you. But, so, uh, so, what did, so what did you learn? Well, he seemed to be very interested in the relationship between the LGBTQ community and the black church, uh, oh, which I think is, is really interesting and really problematic, right? I mean, here you have two different communities that have had different but real patterns of exclusion that could be fantastic allies. And where, by the way, the most vulnerable people among the LGBTQ community are people of color, especially trans women of color, um, who I think would benefit from uh, black faith communities that were accepting but that hasn't always been there. Right. And so he he took a stand that I thought was interesting for someone of his generation to to take today uh, on why there needs to be more solidarity there. Um, But he also encouraged me and, and I have to admit that I, I know as I go into some of these churches, for example, in South Carolina, that this may be a source of, of tension or at least discomfort. Right. Um, that the best thing I can do is just get out there and, and talk to people and I'll, make sure they understand who I am and hope that that, that can be the grounds for... I'll give, you, I'll give you a piece of advice that maybe Al Sharpton wouldn't give you. Yeah. Before you go to a black church, listen to some of the songs mm-hmm. so that when you get there, you can stay on beat. <laughs> No, because a lot of white politicians in America, they go to the black church, and then it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> like, you gotta... If you... I promise yeah. you now, half of, half, of the, half of the campaign is just staying on beat. You stay on beat, and then we're like, no, you respected us enough to just, like, follow the music. There you go. You take that, take that lightly, but let me tell you something now. You move to the beat, you see what happens to your poll numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's, let's take some questions from the audience. We'll take one from this side, and then we'll move to one on, on that side. Y- yes, ma'am, you have your hand up. Hi. Uh, I love everything you say about domestic uh, policies, but how about foreign policies? Are yeah. you for the Iran um, deal? Are you for the um, Paris Accord and all the stuff that Trump wants to take us right. out of? How do you feel about that? Yeah. yeah, so specifically, yes, I think I think the Iran deal is something that we should be party to uh, and, and should strengthen. It's, it's, we didn't do it as a favor to Iran. We did it to reduce a nuclear threat, and it's still a good policy. Um, and I think we, we need to get into the Paris, re- rejoin the, the Paris goals, but it's probably not enough. More broadly, I think the, ish, the next president's going to have to do two things very quickly on foreign policy. One, establish a new bar, and I would say a higher bar, for when you would consider deploying American force. And the second is establish U.S. credibility in the world, because this is a problem. 
So, I mean, there's a whole speech worth of the things I think we'll have to do, and I'll give that speech uh, in, in the future, and you'll hear about kind of what I think that means in terms of our policy toward Asia and how I think uh, our trade diplomacy ought to be related to our climate diplomacy. But the bottom line is, um, you know, America, I, I really felt it when I was deployed in the military and I had the, the flag on my shoulder. I felt that I had a flag on my shoulder representing a country known for keeping its word. Uh, and that, that our allies, but also our adversaries, knew that. And when that is lost, uh, we are definitely less safe. It's not just uh, this kind of high-minded idea of moral authority. It's also that that credibility, lives depend on that credibility. And restoring that will be very challenging and very urgent for the next president. All right, we've got time for uh, one more. <laughs> we will take it. I never take questions from there. So y yes, sir, right in the middle. Um, so recently, President Trump has been tweeting a lot about how strong our economy is, citing unemployment numbers, GDP. Um, I'm curious what, I, I, some of those, I think, numbers are, can be misleading yeah. or um, not necessarily uh, credit to him. What does success look like to you? So to me, it's, it's not just the top lines of growth, because it is true. He has managed to not tank the Obama recovery for a couple of years. Good for him. Um, <laughs> But go back to 2016 and ask how we had a so-called economic anxiety election under conditions that were also full employment back then. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, part of what I think that tells you, though, is that there's a lot of concern that this uh, prosperity isn't widespread. And, and the numbers bear that out. You start the clock in the early 70s, and for 90% of Americans, all but the top 10%, even as the rising tide rises like no rising tide has ever risen before, a lot of the boats didn't budge, right? Median incomes barely moved at all. And so I think what we're seeing, whether it's uh, uh, racial inequality that's persisting and also a racial wealth gap, not just a racial income gap, mm -hmm. or whether it's ways in which the industrial Midwest, like where I live, you know, it, around World War II, you had something like a 90% shot that you were going to wind up earning more than your parents did. Right now, it's a coin flip. And where I come from, it's less than 50-50. If we're not addressing that, then people less and less are going to care what the top line numbers are because it's not reaching people. So what does success look like? It looks like shared prosperity, where the American dream really is achievable, not just in Denmark, but in America, um, that you can be born at any, at any stratum in, in our economy and, and come out much higher than you started. So in that... In that, because I know Mayor, Mayor Pete has to leave. So in that, then, just off of that, um, a report just came out today about some of the top companies in America paying zero federal tax. And this is a story that's all too familiar. You see some of the biggest corporations in America literally paying zero federal tax, whether they right. use offshore tax havens, whether they use loopholes in, in tax law. How do you approach that? Do you think that's something that's needs, that needs to be changed in America? Yeah, of course it needs to change. And... Uh... Again, not to get too much into the guts of how to do it, but I think the basic metaphor to use to design a way to, to handle offshoring is the way we handle taxation within the U.S. among different states. So if you've got a company based in one state and you sell in another state and a few of your employees are in this state, we have a way of apportioning your income based on where you do your sales mm -hmm. to make sure that the different states get a fair share. Uh, we could do the same thing internationally. It's harder and it's more complicated, um, but there are ways to do it. And I think that that has to happen because whether it's through offshoring or any of the other mechanisms that these companies use, I mean, the idea that you can make billions upon billions in profit, which means, of course, that you have profited from good roads and good schools and national security and all the things that are very expensive to provide, then you ought to be paying your share. I think Americans get that. I don't think you have to be a raging leftist to think that that's a problem. Matter of fact, I think a lot of the people uh, who are susceptible to the messaging of this president are as angry, and may have voted for him last time, or as angry about that as I am. And I think if we put forward a credible way of dealing with it, um, that's something that, that will reach across the aisle and is also just the right thing to do. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. <laughs> really good having you. I can't wait to see you at the debates. Mayor Pete, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.